Welcome to the Culinary Vegetable Institute. This kitchen is um, in the middle of nowhere. We are on a farm tucked back in rural Ohio, this agricultural heart of America. Uh, and it's right on the chef's garden. Uh, this kitchen was built about 20 years ago. It was designed by a gentleman named Mark Steknovak with Charlie Trotter and Thomas Keller and Ducasse as our original advisory board. They helped kind of shape it all up. We are flushed full of equipment and it's just a, a great relationship we have with manufacturers, with our partners, with our sponsors that keep us stocked with some of the like, coolest stuff um, in the industry. You know, Dave from PolyScience, um, he suggested that we come on to this presentation for the sake of speaking about vegetables. We, as a general rule, we spend a lot of time focused on a better steak, right? Or like a better short rib or, you know, some better braise, whatever it is. And, and in general, it, it's meat. You know, if I had only one circulator in the kitchen, that might make sense. We don't spend a lot of time in the prep space with vegetables. And that's kind of what we're going to go through today. We have about 600 vegetables on the farm growing right now of different varieties. Um, each one of those varieties has a different part of that plant that offers something unique to the plate. You know, uh, obviously also different sizes. And it's a really interesting game to start to learn. It's a new language in cooking when we're working with vegetables because, you know, hamburger is not a hamburger and a steak is not a steak. And I think that's generally true um, with, with, with proteins, but there seems to be a lot more diversity in vegetables. When we're walking through the farm this morning and, and yesterday, we decided we're going to focus on nightshades specifically because it's, it's August and the potatoes are just coming out of the ground and the eggplants are up and the tomatoes are fruiting and they're amazing. And, uh, even the peppers are coming on. So if we can just focus here in this category for a little bit and in terms of um, sous vide cooking with vegetables, I think we'll, we'll find a lot of diversity and uh, hopefully interest among this group. When we look at, um, when we look at eggplants, we'll start here. Now, honestly, and don't tell anybody this because I'm the chef of the Culinary Vegetable Institute, not a huge fan of eggplants. I, I, if they did not exist, I wouldn't say like, wow, that ingredient in the world is, uh, you know, is missing. What is this thing that we're missing? Like onions or, or potatoes. But um, as we've as we've been working with these with the circulator, we found a lot of pretty interesting techniques. Um, one thing that I do like about eggplant is its ability to just be hammered, right? Like unlike green beans or green vegetables, you can cook the the hell out of this thing, uh, whether it's in a in a fire or in a circulator, and it'll it'll take it. Right, and it'll take on whatever additional flavors you want. So for eggplant, we braise one eggplant. Let's see, here 185 degrees for eight to ten hours in butter, and end up with this really rich, like just so soft, supple, delicious paste uh, can be applied to anything. But another technique on eggplant we've just worked through, which we learned when uh, guest chef Paul Liebrandt came, is a crisp version, uh, eggplant chips. And now this eggplant, which is beautiful, um, could be anything, happens to be eggplant. 
is compressed with a pre-gelatinized starch. Um, it's something you can use. You could use um, tapioca starch. This is maltodextrin and water, um, vacuum seal. We shave it thin. I kept one here so you can kind of see about how thin we slice these. Gently cook them, remove them from the bag, and dry them down. You know, these are finished in a fryer. If you had sugar or something, that'd be nice as well in the mix, but kind of fun. Another ingredient um, we're looking at today is, uh, is peppers. Peppers are um, about as broad of a plant family as any other family that we've seen, right? Like from hot to sweet to hard and bitter uh, to black. We've got about a dozen or two dozen maybe varieties here of different peppers. Um, in this case, we're using and doing a uh, raw pepper compote. And it's something we've adopted from uh, potato salad that we did. And in the potato salad, we used celery specifically um, to produce a somewhat viscous sauce. But what we do for this is a, a nice brunoise of pepper. We salt the pepper and squeeze out extra moisture and we juice any trim. That trim gets hydrated with xanthan gum. And I'm not talking about like a nice level of hydration. I'm really focused on snotty, you know, as, as viscous and ridiculously thick as you can go with xanthan gum. You don't need much, you just need a little bit. And we add it back over those Brunois peppers. And we put them in a bath at 175 degrees for 10 minutes and it just brightens them up. Part of this presentation, you know, and the headline of it that you all signed up for is improving on fundamentals, you know, finding, you know, using modern technology uh, to refine the fundamentals of cooking. And, and I think that's really important because, you know, I'm not trying to say like, we're gonna, uh, improve on everything, but there are some techniques that can be applied with the kitchen um, that, that just make things better, you know. In this case, uh, raw celery compote. We don't have to hammer this, and traditionally you might take a, um, you, know, you might take like, you know, fruits or something and you, you, you cover it in sugar and then you cook it down until it's viscous. This is raw, barely barely blanched, just to brighten up. Uh, it's super crisp, uh, really flavorful, and quite interesting. I wish I could show this to you. Or maybe you can see it. Probably not. If we're gonna talk about improving on fundamentals of cooking, uh, what, what, how do we typically cook vegetables in general? We grill them, uh, we fry them, right? We, we roast them, uh, we puree. Uh, what else do we do with vegetables? We blanch them, we freeze them, we grate them, we churn them. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, I guess in typical uh, kitchen, you might you might see a lot of sauteing, searing, charring, those kinds of things. Uh, we find that using the circulator in advance, specifically in prep, um, you can get vegetables to a stage where some of these items are either much faster or more efficient or more delicious or, or more consistent. That's the case specifically with uh, the macerated pepper. Uh, it's something we're seeing here with the crispy eggplant chip. Uh, something we just saw as well with the heavy braised eggplant. We can look at some other techniques, um, poaching. 
poaching is something we do to vegetables. It's something that you see really applied um, in really nice, like gentle, soft cooks, asparagus. Um, we poach salsify. A lot of these things are poached in either their own juice or poached in milk or poached in some pork bouillon. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, tomatoes, uh, another coveted member of the nine shape family. Tomatoes are here are great. The concept here is like, what you know, what if we could, what if we could poach a tomato at the degree and control um, that would allow us to cook it but for the skin to not break, right? If we could poach a tomato long enough to be barely bound by its own skin, and the interior of this thing, uh, essentially a sauce. And that's the direction we took here. These tomatoes cooked for 150 degrees, uh, one hour. They cooked in a seasoned version of their own juice. And what we're left with, we have some fallen soldiers. Is a tomato that's still in its skin, but so soft. Um, you know, a great contribution to a dish. Something really interesting to find and worth finding and in terms of tomato. Incredible. Tristan, you got to try it. But I want my spoon back. What else do we do with tomatoes? We stew them um, in a circulator. It might be a nice place. You don't obviously get evaporation, but um, cook it to where you want. We've been talking about doing long-term preservation in bags at room temperature. Uh, probably not conversation for our friends at Hassan. Uh, another conversation we had this morning was on, um, was on kind of like low temp caramelization. We talk about black garlic, right? In a water bath, actually a, a circulator just like this, uh, it's a tank with a lid we'll leave on and leave on for three months. And we fill it, we put it in the root cellar downstairs and we put, you know, garlic or, or even green coffee beans. We put uh, unripe fruit in it at 130 degrees for about a month is all it takes. Um, beets, those things just caramelize really, really beautifully. Um, we talked about vegetables in particular of green tomatoes, like really, really young unripe tomatoes in a vacuum bag, 130 degrees for a month, what happens? We'll find out and get back to you. Actually, you get back to us, come on out. With, with any ingredient in general, uh, low temp caramelization, uh, sugar is key, right? If, if, if sugar is not present, um, caramelization is not either. So if we look at, you know, beets are a great example. Lots of lots of sugar and beets. Onions are another great example. Look at anything there. If you've got an extra uh, circulator laying around that you could really cover well, consider that. Uh, potatoes. Another member. We're just starting to dig now. Uh, Yukon Golds. There's some Austrian Crescents. A lot of different, really interesting varieties of potatoes coming out of the ground right now. New potatoes, I find uh, to be a little bit interesting. You know, they're not completely different. They're typically higher in moisture. Um, they have not seen a, a proper curing process yet, but like midsummer potatoes are, you know, for me, a, a really welcome sight. Now, by the end of January, I'm over it. <laughs> We look at uh, two things here. In classic techniques with potatoes, you see like, what do we see? You see mashed potatoes, um, 
you see you know, pureed potatoes, you see poached potatoes. What else do we see? Pickled. You don't see that very classically. What else? Yeah. For mashed potatoes, um, Tristan, and I heard Chris Young was going to be on today. Um, I hate to see him not. Uh, we pulled up the mashed potato recipe on Chef Steps, and it's a really, really smart, um, great uh, approach to potatoes. We've done it several times. So basically, you dice your potatoes uh, at you know 58 percent, 27 percent butter, and 15 percent milk, or half and half, or cream, or something like that. Put it all in a bag. We cook it for. 195 degrees for 45 minutes to an hour, pull it out, tammy it, and uh, serve it. Now these potatoes are delicious, um, specifically the, the potatoes themselves, but the mashed potatoes came out great. And the way I like this method is, you know, we're talking about prep and organization. You know, I came in a restaurant space where we made mashed potatoes every single day. And it was a lot of waste, but it was a lot of it was not a, like a set standard recipe and it was up for the cooks. Every cook tried to make a better mashed potato. And like, you, if you get into a space like this and you've got your AM prep cook uh, and he just does like seven or eight bags of potatoes for the week and you drop a whole bag in, nothing's made yet. You just drop the bag in when you walk in the door and within an hour you're sending it through a Tammy and you've got mashed potatoes. It's really smart. It's really smart today. It removes a lot of guesswork. It removes a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for failure. Um, they're delicious. So consider that chef steps approach to to mashed potatoes because it, it, it works. Now, what I said a minute ago is new potatoes don't allow for much evaporation. Um, uh, new potatoes are higher in moisture, specifically cooking them in a bag will, will not allow for any evaporation. So. If it feels wet, pour it out and just let it kind of steam off on the tammy a little bit before sending it through. And incorporate the liquid back that you need. These felt great. With the peels of those potatoes, we always use them uh, in some form. And this is a basic uh, infusion or baked potato stock which you can find as well. If you have so, we have so, so much flavor in this liquid. Um, one thing to keep in mind is just a gentle roast. But a good opportunity here to add aromats. And you take a liquid like this and in this bag is garlic and thyme with the roasted potato peels. we have a, a beautiful baked potato stock. And this is at a steep uh, temperature in the circulator. For us, we like to steep things. We've got this at 120 degrees or 48 C, and it can sit and hang out for hours. Uh, when we're steeping other things, uh, herbs, oils, um, we're steeping uh, lots of fats, steeping dairy before we make ice cream uh, with as many vegetables or herbs we can think of. We do the same thing, um, 140, 120 degrees, somewhere in there, and just let it let it ride. This is a bag we have in the works for, you know, one of our housekeepers is making soap. And uh, it's just a bag of marigolds in, in the olive oil. That olive oil goes then to soap production. But it's really interesting and, and a great way to incorporate flavors into fats as well. If I were doing this, you know, 200 years ago, so let's put it this way. If Escoffier had an immersion circulator, for all you purists out there, he, you know he would have used one. We use this as a tool to help control consistency as much as possible. And, uh, and we hope you do too, with vegetables, as much as possible. Okay. Well, Chef, thank you for sharing some of those great techniques. I've never made a uh, 
a baked potato stock before that looks really cool and just some of those infusions you're making um that looks so flavorful and i love that xanthan gum um puree you made some of that stuff is just great uses of you know taking uh you know traditional techniques and kind of tweaking them and uh achieving that kind of consistency that you can't always do with with other methods 